If you would, turn in your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 1. We're continuing talking about dreaming or having God's will done in our lives today. How do we energize a dream that God has laid upon our heart? I have dreams for the ministry. I have dreams for this church. I have dreams. Uh, I was laughing at the one I had last night. I've got to go to a neurologist tomorrow for my hand. And in this dream, uh, the he prescribed some medication for me, and I had to call Captain Kirk up on, on the Enterprise to see if I was able to take it. And he hung up on me. All kinds of strange dreams at nighttime, right? But the, the reality of it is we're all time dreaming, dreaming, dreams that are things that God would have us to do. So how do we energize those dreams? How do we make them occur and certainly be able to pass it on to other people? Today I want you to take a look at 1 Samuel and the story of Hannah, a great story. I hope all of you will read it in its entirety because Hannah every year would go to the temple and pray that God would give her a child. Made God promises, and she kept those promises. You know, back when I was growing up, every Sunday afternoon, we took the Richmond Times Dispatch, and uh, me, uh, myself and, and my siblings, my sisters and all, our first thing was to lay in the floor at the house and pull out the funny pages. And we would all read the funny pages and fight over them or share them or one thing or another. But one of my favorite uh, video, not videos, but, uh, but comics in there uh, all through the week was a comic called The Family Circus. Maybe you remember The Family Circus. And I still remember to this day one in particular here uh, about this time of year. But uh, the father was talking with his children, his wife and his children, as they sat around. And he asked them the question, what is the greatest power source in the world? What is the greatest power source in the world? And you see these idea bubbles, you know, like you used to see in comics, come over the heads of each child. One child was thinking, when the daddy asked, what's the greatest power source? One child was thinking about high power, uh, high voltage power lines. Another child had a picture of speeding racing cars. Another child had a, a picture of a nuclear explosion. And another one had a picture of Niagara Falls. Well, the mama had an idea bubble over her head, thinking about what is the most powerful uh, force in the world today. Her thought said, and this is what she was thinking, she was thinking about her children kneeling beside their beds saying their prayers. And I think that probably is what all of us would agree. There's nothing more powerful than God's children kneeling by their beds, driving to work, standing in the shower, wherever it might be, and praying for a God-given dream. Somebody very simply has said something that every one of us ought to be aware of. They said, prayer is the nerve that moves the hand of God. Prayer is the nerve that moves the head of God. Somebody else has said, All hell trembles when the weakest saint is on his knees. Now that brings me then to a verse in the New Testament that I want to share with you before we get into 1 Samuel. It's from James. James was the half-brother of our Lord who didn't get saved until after the, the, the resurrection of the Lord, and he became a dynamite part of the early church. But James wrote this. Very simply, he said, The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Availeth much. Now this morning, we're going to be looking at Hannah. Hannah wasn't just a dreamer, nor did, uh, did her life uh, end... Uh, filled with regret because she had dreams that never got filled. Hannah energized her dreams through prayer, and her dream came true. See, energized dreams are energized through our prayers. If you have the vision of this church being filled, it starts with prayer. If you had a vision of your children getting saved and getting, becoming a part of the church and taking over into the next generation. It begins with prayer. Every dream that we have 
is energized by going to the Lord in prayer. Let's begin then with the first part, verse 1 and 2, where Hannah had a dream that was still, to this point, unfulfilled. She had a dream that was unfulfilled. We see this as we begin the chapter. Notice in verse 1, it says, Now there was a certain man of Ramoth Zophram, of the Mount of Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham. Uh, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, uh, and an Ephraimite. But notice verse 2. And he had two wives. The name of one was Hannah, and the name of the other was Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. Now, Hannah had a great dream. Much like the dreams of many young ladies today as they begin uh, out in their life, they have a great dream of, of having a family, a husband that loves them, and children that they can love and raise. But she never, she never guessed on her wedding day the sorrow that was going to follow her for years to come because she had no children. Years passed. Years passed. And Hannah was unable to have children, and children that she had always dreamed about having. You can understand. Now, I want to give you a little bit of background to know, let you know why this is so important. In the Old Testament times, barrenness for a woman was actually considered to be a curse. If a woman did not have a child, she was considered to be cursed. A childless woman was considered to be a failure in the Old Now, I'm not saying that's the way God looked at them. I'm saying that's the way society looked at them. They were considered to be a failure. She was an embarrassment to her husband. And a husband actually, according to law of that day, a husband actually had the right to divorce his wife if she was unable to produce children. That's how serious they were. Children were an important part of the economic standing of families in that day. Large families were a symbol of status. They were a symbol of wealth. Now, this is a good news, bad news story for Hannah. The good news was that her husband, Elkna, loved her very much, very much, and let her know how much he loved her. Her marriage was safe. That's the good news. The bad news was that Elkna had a second wife whose name was Penina, who had given Elkna many sons and many daughters, and Hannah had had had. had uh, Hannah's bad dream became actually a living nightmare as far as living in this home. Now, let me take just a brief moment to chase a rabbit trail, because I know many of you ask the questions, how come there were multiple marriages in the Old Testament to people? Uh, why did a husband have more than one wife? Well, you don't have to look very hard to find examples of polygamy in the Old Testament. Jacob and Esau. The grandsons of Abraham, David, Solomon, all the other kings of Israel and Judah, all had multiple wives. Not even the example of David, a man after God's own heart, legitimizes polygamy. From the very beginning, God's plan has always been in marriage, one man for one woman for one lifetime. Because of the hardness of people's hearts in Deuteronomy, God allowed divorce because men were just putting their, their wives uh, out on the front porch. And in that day, a woman couldn't get a job. And if she didn't have a son to to uh, take care of her, she would end up in total poverty or in prostitution to be able to to take care of herself. And so God, because of the hardness of the heart in the book of Deuteronomy, made the man write a writ of divorcement. As we find in the New Testament, the only reason given for divorcement has to do with with infidelity. But here we find in Genesis that God starts out the home to, as a picture of Christ in the church by simply saying, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Now, why then did polygamy exist among God's people, like Abraham and Isaac and all the rest? The short answer is this. Uh, it was the same reason that husbands took multiple wives, even in pagan countries, even this day. I've been in multiple countries 
uh, with the mission boards and whatnot over the years. And even in this day and age, there are many tribes and, and cultures where, where men will multiply their wives. But why is polygamy a, a, in common practice uh, back especially in the Old Testament and even in this day and age? Let me give you five reasons that are given for men having multiple wives. Not biblical reasons, but reasons. First of all, it enables a man to have more children. Uh, that just, uh, you have more wives, you have more children, uh, and, and so they marry more women. That also uh, is a continuation of a man's family line, increasing increasingly by having more sons. So the more sons he has, the more of a family line he will have. A third reason is given in that a large family increases the labor force. Many of you will remember back with your mama and daddy and perhaps even in your own life, living on the farm, you tried to have as many kids as possible because you had a lot of cows and a lot of land and a lot of work to be done. Uh, I remember when we had our fourth child, Josh, when he came along, uh, we had the uh, doctors and the nurses wanting to discuss with us stopping. <laughs> that was too many kids to have four children, and that's just in our lifetime. Even in China, they they hold it off at two. Uh, uh, I think they're giving up on that for a while because China needs more people. But the reality is that a large number of children uh, uh, helped in a society that was aggregate or an agricultural society to have more of a labor force. A fourth reason is a large number of children were a symbol of, of status and wealth. The more children that a man had, the more status he had in the community. And then the fifth reason is often many young men were killed in battle among warring nations. Therefore, polygamy was an acceptable way of supporting women who could otherwise, if they weren't married, would be turned out into poverty and have no one that would look after them. So there were a lot of rules and regulations in the law of the day, especially even in the Old Testament. Not biblical, but yet rules of society. But despite all of these uh, benefits of polygamy, the Bible, of course, teaches that a husband having multiple wives uh, often caused serious problems in the family. Here's one example, Elka's family. Elka's family was no exception to rivalry among the women, a rivalry among his wives, Hannah and Penina. Uh, uh, let's go back to Hannah's dream, a dream that was unfulfilled, and find out the real problem that even Elka had in his family. Notice, if you would, in the second place, in verse number 7 of this chapter, we find that God uh, will sometimes postpone the fulfillment of our dreams. I want you to remember that a God-given dream takes time. We've said it time and time again. It takes time. No one dreams a dream and wakes up to discover that dream has become a reality. Sometimes the delay in the part of God uh, and God's will is a part of fulfilling a greater purpose that God, that God actually has. We have the dream. We pray about it. Remember, David went from his teenage years all the way into his 30s before he became the king of Israel. And, so, and yet God had told him when he was a teenager that he would be the king. And so we find that God has to prepare us to be able to accept and to do something with a dream that he gives us uh, to be able to do uh, what he's laid upon our heart. We see in verse number seven that the Bible says, and as he did so many, so year after year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, so she provoked her, therefore she wept and did not eat. You see, Hannah didn't just have a bad day with Penina. Did you notice that? It wasn't just that Penina got up on the wrong side of the bed and started deciding that she was going to give Hannah a bad time. No, Hannah had to endure the criticism and the cutting remarks of her rival year after year after year and broken and crushed within her soul. Hannah would cry out to God, God, have you forsaken me? Please give me a child. Show me uh, what you want to do with me. Imagine. Suppose you had to come to church every week and there was a rival in the church that, that taunted you 
and said ugly things to you and made fun of you and ridiculed you every week in church, how would you feel? How would that make you feel even as you came to church? That's what Hannah was doing. She was going to the temple. She was going to be able to pray. And that's what Hannah felt. She said, God, are you there? Do, do you even care that I'm suffering year after year because I'm not able to have a child? Remember what I said, a childless woman was considered in that culture. Now, who do you, who do you know that's struggling today? I ran into several this week that are struggling financially, struggling uh, with, with their jobs, struggling in their marriage, struggling with their health. Now, maybe you know somebody that's struggling and, and they don't feel like God is really listening to their prayer. They prayed about it and prayed about it and prayed about it and they're still struggling. Or perhaps God has postponed your dream and because God hasn't answered your prayer, you're discouraged. I had a deacon in one of my previous churches in his 70s at that time whose brother had never asked Christ to be uh, his Savior. His brother at that time was 65 years old. And every Sunday morning, G.A. would come into my office and he would ask if he could use my phone. And on the church phone, he would call his brother, please, let me pick you up today. Please, let me pick you up and bring you to church. You need to, be, you need to get saved. And his brother would always cordially say, thank you for the invitation, but not today. Not today. G.A. was killed coming home from church one Sunday evening, uh, crossing over 53. Truck hit him right in the side, took him uh, took him on home to be with the Lord. And it was at his funeral that his brother got saved. As far as I know, still in the church today. G.A. never saw the answer to that prayer, which he prayed every single Sunday with a group of men. He'd pray and cry and weep over his brother, but his brother didn't get saved until after G.A. went home to be with the Lord. And because of G.A.'s accident, because God took him home. His brother was reminded about what G.A. had said, and God answered that prayer, and his brother got saved. You see, well, so many times we pray once or twice, and then we give up. You may have a prayer. You've prayed over and over and over again, and it doesn't seem like God's listening. May I say, God hears every prayer. And the Bible teaches that He collects our tears that we shed. Somebody needs to come along, perhaps, and lift you up or lift up those prayers and the dreams that you have to encourage you along the way. So when your inspired, uh, spirit-inspired dream is delayed, don't give up on God. When your timing seems to have been postponed and, and your patience is and waiting on God is beginning to wear thin. May I encourage you, just keep on. God has His time. Habakkuk, or as the Jews would say, Habakkuk. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 3 says, For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. You can counter the fact that when you pray, when it is a God-given dream and you're praying in the will of God, it will come. It will come. The God-given dream aches to come true. It aches to come true. It's, it can hardly wait to come true. A God-given dream is independent on the fact whether you see it or not, whether it becomes real in your life or not, it aches to come true. God gave the dream. And if God gave the dream, God will bring about the fulfillment of that dream in His time. In His time. Not your time. His time. So be patient. And don't lose faith in God. The dream will come true at the right time. Somebody said this, God is seldom early. He's never late. God is always right on time. Something we ought to all remember. God is never early or late. He's always right on time. So what is the third thing I want you to see today? In the third place, dreams are energized through personal and persistent prayer. 
We learn this from the life of Hannah in verse number 10. In verse number 10, Elkah had tried to support his wife. Did you get that? He had tried to tell her, I love you. Don't worry about it. It's okay. Our marriage is solid. He tried to encourage his wife. Elka would say, don't you know how much I love you? Isn't my love for you better than ten sons? He would say. Kind words from a husband. I think every husband ought to share those with his wife. Terry will say, do you love me? And I'll say, well, I told you that 45 years ago when I married you. And if it ever changes, I'll let you know. That never suffices. I don't understand why. But the reality is that every wife loves it when her husband says, I love you. Matter of fact, the Bible teaches us that we are to love our wives and to live with them with knowledge. Why? Because men, so many times we forget to show it and to speak it. Loving your wife. Hannah needed to know not that her husband loved her, but that God loved her. That's what she needed to know. Does God love me? She needed her faith to be encouraged. Hannah needed to get in touch with God and to know what God uh, uh, was that God was with her, even in the midst of the trial that she was going through. God, are you still there? Hannah needed to know that the God of the dream was working on her behalf. So Hannah went to God in prayer in verse number 10. And the Bible says that she cried out. It says that she was in bitterness of soul, bitterness of soul, and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. That means that she, you, you've heard someone cry so hard they can't even catch their breath. She was weeping before the Lord. She cried inconsolably. Only God could help her now. God heard Hannah's prayer. God heard her prayer, and he gathered up all the tears that she had cried. Hannah de a dream lay like a seed on, on dry, barren ground, and God took the tears that Hannah had, had wept and prayed and watered that seed until it came into, into reality. Folks, listen. When your dreams are delayed, God will take your prayer, even your tears, and he'll use those to water the dream that he has for you. The answers to that prayer. Personal prayer emphasizes or energizes dreams and brings those dreams to life. I want you to remember that nothing, as I read through this chapter a number of times, nothing in this entire chapter uh, and story causes us to believe that Hannah only prayed one time. The Bible does not say that, that she only prayed one time, even though we have her prayer recorded. You know, so many times we live in a day of wanting microwavable prayers. You know what I mean? You pop them in, you pop them out, and you have at it. We want microwavable prayers. We want to receive the answer just as soon as we pray it. Lord, I prayed for this yesterday. I'm not going to give you more, more than one more chance. You know, we want our prayers answered and we're not even ready to receive the answer. We've not grown by the difficulty. But that's not reality, folks. That's just fantasy. That's fantasy. Terry and I prayed for two years to be able to come to Rome, to Floyd County. For two years, we prayed that God would bring us here because we had family needs. Two years. And now we've been here for five years. When God was ready, my father passed away in, uh, in July, and we were here be on, the, on the field in October. You see, it was only after my father passed that God brought us to the place where he wanted us to be. And we were here to be with Marvin the last uh, year or, or better than a year of his life. And so we find here that God answers prayer year after year. Hannah went with her husband to worship, to go to Shiloh and worship God. And every year, Penina was there, taunting, rubbing salt in the wound year after year. You know, I asked the question, why didn't Hannah just stay home? Why did she even go to church? Remember, in the Old Testament, women were never commanded by God to go to the temple. The men were commanded to go to the temple. Hannah went to the temple voluntarily to go in Shiloh to be able to pray 
that God would answer her prayer. So why did she go? Why did she suffer year after year under Penina's cruel words? I believe it's because Hannah had to persevere in prayer. She would continue to call out to God until she received an answer. You remember what Jesus said? Jesus said, ask and it shall be given unto you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth. And he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Why are our dreams then energized by personal prayer? Why couldn't Hannah, Hannah's dream for children be fulfilled through her husband's prayer? You know, Elka went to the temple to pray every year. Why couldn't Hannah's prayer be answered because her husband prayed for it? I'll tell you why. In Hannah's story, the simple answer was that Elka uh, had a hard time even encouraging his wife to have any kids. His house was already full. He had sons and he had daughters. Now, I want you to remember what I said last week. Dissatisfaction is a key to dreaming a God-given dream. If you're satisfied with the status quo, you won't dream the dream. You won't pray for the dream. You won't uh, beseech God for something in your life. But when you get dissatisfied with your children being lost, when you're dissatisfied with an ungodly job, when you're dissatisfied with your growth in the Lord and your participation in the church, then and only then will a, there be a change there are folks that are sitting at home right now should be in church, but they'll never be in church until they're dissatisfied with the emptiness in their heart. Amen. And then they'll serve the Lord. Why do you and I need to pray in order for our dreams to be realized? Isn't it good enough that the pastor prays for us? Isn't it good enough just to put your name on our prayer list? Isn't it good enough just to uh, to speak it out, you know, isn't that good enough? I want to, I want to leave this, and I don't want you to forget this. Simply, personal, persistent prayer energizes your dreams. In other words, prayer is faith in action. Prayer is faith in action. Hebrews chapter eleven, verse one, the the faith chapter starts out by saying that faith is the substance of things not seen. And the evidence, I'm sorry, the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Faith, that's what faith is. A divine, daring dream can't be seen with natural eyes. The dream that God gives you has to come from your spirit-inspired imagination. God lays it on your heart. It may not be something you've ever seen. It might not be something that has that ever crossed your mind. But God lays something on your heart. And through the eyes of faith, you can see it as if it already exists. James wrote this. Let, it, let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Have faith in God. Not just faith in God. Have active faith in God. That makes you live a certain way. Act a certain way. Give a certain way. Believe a certain way. It needs to be active faith. Not just faith. Praying. Prayer. And pray believing that God will indeed bring about the completion of this dream that He Himself has laid on your heart. Now, I know some of you say, Pastor, that all sounds well and good. You're probably right, but I just don't know if I can make it even another day. I just don't know that I can pray another day about this. I, this thing has got to happen now. So what happens when our dreams aren't just postponed, but they seem to be dying because we're losing faith. Well, do you remember back to the story of Judas that we talked about a week or two ago? I want you to remember the key word to the story of Judas. It was the word isolation. Isolation is one of the dream killers 
that prevented Judas from seeing his dreams uh, resurrected. Elkna may not have, have done a very good job, but he at least reassured Hannah of his love for her. And as long as Hannah knew that she was loved, the dream was still possible because she still had her husband. And she knew that with her husband, they could produce a child and that God, remember the Bible teaches that children are a gift from God. God could give her that child that laid on her heart. We need the word of God spoken to us. When I do counseling, I speak the Word of God. I don't give you my opinion. I tell you what the Bible teaches. And this is what the Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. You don't need to know what I think. You don't need to know what Dr. Spock thinks. You don't need to know what Oprah Winfrey says. You need to know what the Word of God says. Amen. And then that will make a difference in your life. We can also be encouraged to dream again through the power of praying in agreement together with somebody else or have somebody come around you and put your arm around them and just say, it's going to be all right. It's going to be okay. I know you're depressed. I know you're discouraged. I know it's a hard time, but God's going to answer your prayer in his time. The last thing I want you to see is this found in verse number 11. Seeing our dreams fulfilled requires faithfulness to our commitment to the Lord. Let me put it another way. Let me put it to you this way. If we want God to keep His Word and to bring our, our dreams into reality, then we have to likewise keep our promise to God. If you want God to keep His promise to you, then you can't go around and play as if God, your promise to God doesn't matter. Take a look at verse number 11. It says in verse 11, And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thy handmaid and remember me and not forget thy handmaid, but will give unto thy handmaid a man-child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. That's the vow of the Nazarene, the Nazarite vow, the Nazarite vow. So she said, I will give him to the Lord. He can serve you. Hannah kept that promise. She gave her son that was born, whose name was Samuel. She gave her son Samuel back to the Lord. Hannah had nothing to lose. She had no child and everything to gain. Perhaps she would she would have something she could offer her husband, a child. But she, more than that, she had something she could give back to God, a son. When I was born, my mother and father dedicated me to the Lord. When our children were born, within one week, the very next Sunday, every one of my kids were in church, and every one of them dedicated to the Lord. Even now, they're in service for God. They're not living with me, not living around me. Love to see my grandkids as much as possible. But more than that, I want to know that my kids have a heart for God. Everything else will take care of itself. You remember what Solomon said? When thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it, for he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. Better is it that thou shouldest not vow that thou shouldest vow and not pay. Folks, prayer is powerful. Your dreams and my dreams will be energized by the personal, persistent times of prayer that we spend. And the key to unleashing the power of prayer is to pray in faith. I have met over the last several weeks with preacher after preacher after preacher in Floyd County, Bartow County, others that have come from outside. And most of them will share with, with you exactly what I'm saying here today. They are discouraged. They are despondent. They are ready to quit. Some have quit because of the activity of their people. But they're praying that their church would come back around. Meantime, they're ready to throw their prayer life out because God hasn't answered that prayer. 
We all need to pray. We need to seek God. We need to get back to the business that God has laid upon us. Billy Graham made a statement years ago, and I never forgot it. He said, heaven is full of answers to prayers for which no one ever bothered to ask. Heaven is filled with the answers to prayer. Can you imagine going to heaven one day? And God said, let me show you something. And opened a door to a room and said, here's all the answers to the prayers that you, I, I was just waiting for you to pray. Waiting for you to believe. Here's all the answers that you were looking for that you never asked me more than one time. You never grew to receive them. Folks, this is an important matter. Have faith in God. He is the God of the dream. Let, let, we need to ask God to bring those dreams to, to completion in His time. And meantime, continue to bring them before the Lord because they are that important. It's just waiting for our personal and our persistent request that we don't forget, that we don't quit. Hannah went year after year, no matter the cost, no matter the persecution, no matter the difficulty. Hannah was in church every single year to pray and to bring this thing before God and made God a promise. And she kept that promise. And her son served in the temple all of his life. Next week is Thanksgiving Sunday. I've got something special I want to say to you next week. I hope you'll bring people with you. No better way to kick off this time this year than to be able to give God praise. Shall we stand?